Welcome, everyone. I'm pleased that you're able to join us today. It's my privilege to be able to introduce this topic to you. We're talking about uh, clean energy and the things we can do. And I want to let you know that this is part one of a two part series. And the second part will be next Friday at noon. Before we start, there's some housekeeping matters I'd like to cover with you. First of all, we you have to stay on pursuant to the Utah Supreme Court rules. You have to stay on for the entire hour in order to get credit. If for some reason you bounce off and have to sign in using a different ID, please email me at L-O-R-I dot N-E-L-S-O-N at law dot Utah dot E-D-U. And I will be able to link up your two accounts to make sure you have the requisite amount of time to stay on to get credit. Also, we're asking for questions don't use the chat feature, use the Q&A feature. And you can see that down at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Use the Q&A feature if you have any questions and we will wait till the end to answer, to ask those and answer them. Also, you can like those questions and the questions that get the most likes will rise up to the top. First of all, I would like to thank Glenn Watkins, who is my prior law partner at Jones Waldo, who brought this idea to me, and I think it's a brilliant idea, and I'm so pleased he introduced me to Sarah at Utah Clean Energy. Sarah created Utah Clean Energy a number of years ago and has been the driving force behind it, and it's an absolutely fabulous thing that she's doing. And right now, I would like to turn over to Sarah the opportunity to further introduce herself and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori. I am really pleased and grateful to be here and grateful to all of you that have made the time to join us today. A little bit about Utah Clean Energy. We've been working to accelerate the understanding of climate risk and climate solutions in Utah for nearly 20 years. And as Lori explained, this is part one of a two-part series. And I really hope that you'll come back next week to hear from Hunter Holman, our staff attorney, and Josh Kraft, our government and corporate a relations manager to hear about policy solutions in Utah and on the federal front, and also administrative law and utility regulatory um, solutions. So come back next Friday. And then today, as you listen to Dr. Davies um, and some of the sobering realities that we face with respect to climate change, I think it would be helpful to keep a few things in mind. One is that the solutions to climate change and the decarbonization of our electricity supply, our homes, our buildings, they're available now and they're really affordable. Wind, solar, geothermal, coupled with storage, electric vehicles, all of those things are available. So as you, you hear what we're up against, understand that the solutions are at hand. The other thing is that climate risk and climate solutions will reshape every aspect of our lives and there is a role for everyone um, in driving these solutions. So um, law, really across all sectors, um, we need everyone's help. And then the final thing I'd like to leave you with is that 70% of the polling shows that 70% of the public is concerned about climate change, but only about a third of those are speaking about it with even their closest friends and family. And so we can't solve a problem unless we're talking about it. And then also that we're reaching out to our elected officials to know that it's something that we care about. So um, it's gonna, Rob's presentation can be um, a little hard on the heart sometimes, <laughs> but um, know that we have what it takes to solve the issue. And so now I get to turn things over to Dr. Davies. He's um, a physicist whose work focuses on global change, system science and human vibrancy. He has delivered hundreds of public lectures. And in my opinion, he's one of the best climate communicators around. He served as a scientific liaison for NASA, a project scientist with the Utah State University's Space Dynamics Laboratory, and an officer and meteorologist in the United States Air Force. Um, he served on the faculty of three universities. He's past associate of the Utah Climate Center. 
and he's currently Associate Professor of Professional Practice with Utah State University, and he holds a very interesting joint appointment, the Department of Physics, USU's Ecology Center, and the Kane College of the Arts. So really pleased to introduce Dr. Davies to you, turning it over. Right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction. And Lori, uh, for the invitation as well, and Glenn, for your work in, in putting this together. So <clears throat> as Sarah said, uh, this is the first presentation in um, uh, a series of two. Um, and I think, uh, so this is part one. This is kind of the gut punch, as Sarah uh, alluded to. Part two next week uh, will be what what uh, what to do about it. And uh, hopefully you'll be thinking about that as we go. Uh, I think most people are. So as Sarah said, I, uh, I work in the field, I'm a physicist by training, but uh, I work in the field of global change uh, and complex systems and human vibrancy. And uh, I'm titling this talk Disruption. Um, and there are all kinds of disruptions, of course. There are good disruptions and there are bad disruptions. That typically refers to, I think we normally use it as rapid amounts of change. And of course, what we're really gonna talk about here is the global change that's happening uh, in this hour. And I wanna fit it in a broader context. And that context is this notion of the Anthropocene, which is our the renaming of our most recent geologic epoch. The world's uh, geologists have told us that humans are now the single largest driver of change on the surface of the planet. And so they've renamed our most geologic epoch since we came out of the, la the last ice age about 12,000 years ago from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. And while climate change is certainly a piece of our impact on the planet, a very critically important piece, it is by no means the only one. So we're gonna talk about climate change for sure. I'm gonna briefly review the basics of anthropogenic or human caused climate change. Um, but we're quickly gonna to get to the notion of what the science is telling us about what we have to do about it. And as Sarah said, most of you on this call, I think it's safe to say, uh, understand that this is happening, understand that humans are driving this change. But where we fall down as a society is that most of us don't understand the scale uh, of both the risks that we're facing, the rapidity with which those are coming on to us and the scale of the response that is required to mitigate those risks. And we also don't understand the broader context into which climate change fits. And so I'm gonna talk about both of those things because they're critically important as we make big steps in moving forward to address this topic. And then finally, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'm gonna briefly mention um, what has I have found I, and I believe is the proper mindset for, uh, for us to move forward and from which we can then hopefully mitigate these, this, these very large uh, risks that we're facing. All right, so uh, let's talk about first this notion of climate change. It's happening very rapidly, and so I'm gonna use the term disruption for that. And just a couple of brief terms. The first term is emissions, and we talk about how we are digging up fossil fuels and burning them and, and uh, dumping the carbon into the atmosphere. So how much we burn and throw up into the atmosphere we call emissions and we measure those in gigatons. That's billions of tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, and then of course those, uh, uh, that carbon dioxide builds up in the atmosphere. Not all of it stays there, but quite a lot of it does. And they build up into concentrations. And our term for that is parts per million. So how many carbon dioxide molecules for every million other molecules? So those are the two things that we're gonna come back to. Emissions in gigatons and concentrations in the atmosphere in parts per million. And uh, here's a graph of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere going back about a thousand years or so. And what you see then is the parts per million on the left. Uh, and you can see for most of the last thousand years, We've been at about 280 parts per million until we get to the, the onset in the, here in the 19th century, early 19th century, late 18th of the Industrial Revolution when human beings start to burn fossil fuels in significant quantity. And then you see it start to climb. And then when we get to the middle of the 20th century here, sort of a globalized, uh, made efficient by technology, mass acceleration of this. Uh, we see this really big spike to where we are now. So pre-industrially, we were at about 280 parts per million, actually stayed there for about the last 12,000 years. And here's where we are today, about 417 parts per million. And the reason that this is important 
is because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. And greenhouse gases, because of their molecular structures, are able to take energy that's leaving the Earth's system in the form of light, mostly infrared light, so we can't see it, but it's there nonetheless, and stop that energy from leaving the Earth's system and turn that light energy into thermal energy. So it heats the atmosphere and then the oceans and the land as well. And so that is what is happening. We understand this greenhouse effect very well, and that is what's driving the warming. And here's what that warming looks like from the end of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th to today. And what this map is showing you is temperature change, not temperature. So as the different locations went from the cooler blues to the warmer reds, those locations were warming up. And you can see that the warming is by far not uniform, but it is fully global. And, it, and um, let me just show that to you one more time, just so you can get a sense of it. End of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th to today. So again, temperature change, not temperature. The North Pole didn't suddenly get warmer than the equator, but it is warming faster. And if you average all the locations on the Earth, what we find is over the last century or so, we've warmed now about 1.2 degrees Celsius. And if you're a little metrically challenged, that's okay, I understand. You can always convert a temperature change from Celsius to Fahrenheit by roughly doubling it. So that's about a two degree Fahrenheit change. And most of that has happened in the last 40 years. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but you might wanna consider uh, that geologically speaking, and when you talk about the living systems on the planet, we warmed up out of the last ice age at about one degree Fahrenheit per thousand years. And we warmed up about 10 or 12 degrees Fahrenheit total. We're now warming at a rate of about 50 times that fast. And so this is a very different mechanism that's warming us. We'll come to that in a little bit. Um, and it's happening much, much faster. And it is in fact being quite disruptive to both human and natural systems. Now, that's global warming and it's anthropogenic global warming driven by our burning of fossil fuels. And of course, what happens in the earth system is everything is connected. So if you change the temperature, you change everything else about our environment. So uh, for example, you change everything about the frozen environment, continental ice sheets like Iceland and Greenland, the frozen polar ice cap, frozen tundra, even snowpack like we have here in Utah. You change whole weather patterns because of the way, because weather patterns arise from exchange of energy between the earth and the oceans. You change the kind of precipitations you get, um, snow versus rain. You change where and when and how intense. I think most of us know that if you warm the atmosphere, uh, evaporation intensifies. And so roughly speaking, the atmosphere can then keep more water vapor in it. And so dry areas tend to get drier, but then, when you do get a storm, there's more moisture up there to come down. And so precipitation becomes much more intense as well. Think things like Hurricane Harvey a few years ago in Houston dropping five feet of rain in just a single storm event. In China, getting an entire year's worth of rain in just three days in certain locations this year. There are many, many such examples. And if this were the only uh, impact of, uh, on the weather of, of changing the climate, it would be huge. But of course we change everything else. The jet stream, which is our major storm track here in the middle latitudes, is driven by um, our climate. And as that climate changes, the jet stream is changing. It's making both cold events and warm events more intense. It changes locations and drought intensities and drought frequencies, heat waves, which are by far the most deadly uh, weather event for humans. We change internal climate cycles like the El Nino-La Nina cycle which is again, the change of energy between the oceans and the atmosphere. We change just about everything in the life living environment, the biosphere, where things can live, where they can't, things uh, where things migrate to, where they don't. Here in Utah, the, the changes are, are quite big as uh, species move up in the alpine environment, trying to maintain their preferred climate. And we change basically everything else. We change lake and river chemistry, ocean chemistry, as we've talked about ocean chemistry, everything changes. And that then is what we mean by climate change. So anthropogenic global warming, human caused global warming is driving, in fact, disrupting the entire planetary climate system. And that's what we refer to as climate change. Now here in Utah, uh, we are certainly not exempt 
What I'm showing you here is a map of temperatures going back about 100 years or so for different locations around the state. You can pick out your own location. I'm up here in Logan. <clears throat> Many of you, I think, are in Salt Lake. And this blue line is the temperature trend in those locations over the last 40 years. And what we find is that Utah as a whole is warming at about twice the global average over the last 40 years. And that is what you see with uh, most of these graphs. Down here in southeastern Utah, Hanksville and Bluff warming at close to two and a half, even pushing three times the global average for the last 40 years. So we are certainly not exempt from the warming and the impacts of that warming. And we often talk in terms of averages, average temperatures going up, but where the biggest impacts occur are changes in extremes. And so uh, here in Utah, we're seeing that. I'm gonna show you that right now. Changes in extreme temperatures. Uh, and I picked Tooele as just an example. The pattern is the same for the entire state, but this kind of puts a face on it. So the graph you're looking at is a graph of how many days in the various decades going back about 100 years were above 90 degrees in Tooele. So this is what we call the high temperature tail of how warm it gets in a particular location. So here is the number of days in the 1900s, the 1910s, the 1920s. You see this spike in the 1930s during uh, a regional change in climate, not global, but regional, the Dust Bowl. Um, and then starting here in the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, uh, a continuous and rather large increase in the number of days above 90 degrees in Tooele. Uh, this is when in the 1970s, the human push on the climate system became bigger than all of the natural tugs on the climate system and has continued to get bigger still uh, for, the, for the last 40 or 50 years. And then if we go higher in the temperature tail, so let's look at days above 95 degrees, you see that signal of a dramatic amplification in the number of days going to higher and higher extremes gets bigger. And as we go even further, let's say to 100 degrees, you really start to see this. So 66 days in the entire 20th century in Tooele above 100 degrees. And in the first 10 years of this century, we had nearly 100 such days. 66 days in the 20th century, nearly 100 such days in the first decade of this century. And if we go even further, 101, 102, 103 degrees, four days above 103 degrees in Tooele in the entire 20th century, 28 days in the first decade of this century. And we talk about this because this is where some of the biggest impacts to both natural and human systems occurs when we get those really hot or really cold days. <clears throat> One more impact I want to point out here in Utah, near and dear to most of our hearts, how much snow we get. The snowpack here in Utah has been uh, decreasing over the last 40 years, particularly in the lower and mid elevations as we get more of our precipitation as rain instead of snow. And if you look in Park City, the number of days below 32 degrees, or another way to put that is the number of days in which it could snow in Park City has dropped by six weeks over the last 50 years. And that trend continues. And we also see, as I said, declining snowpack, changes to um, our ecosystems here, bark beetle infestations uh, as one example. And then uh, uh, of course, as we are all familiar with here in the West, these bigger and much hotter wildfire seasons, all of which have a very, very pronounced global warming climate change fingerprint on them. So that's the story of climate change in a nutshell. Earth is warming. It's because of us, principally from the burning of fossil fuels. This is disrupting the entire planetary climate system. And this fourth bit is what I now want to spend a little bit more time on, which is that this change, if it continues unmitigated, comes with extreme risks for humans, human civilization, and the human ecosystem. And this, these four points are considered scientific knowledge. And what we mean in science when we say we know something is that these Conclusions are consistent with many independent lines of evidence and inconsistent with no lines of evidence. Doesn't mean that those conclusions won't become refined uh, as more knowledge comes in, but the chances that they absolutely flip are essentially zero. We know these things as well as we know anything scientifically. <clears throat>
And so what we need to do is be on the same page with that information before we can move forward meaningfully as a society with a response. So let's start looking at the scale and we'll start with the scale of the risks and then look at the scale of the response required. Now here's a projection for North America temperature change under a high carbon scenario. That is the scenario we are currently following. So this is the temperature change we can expect across North America over the next 80 years or so. <clears throat> and I will uh, compare that with the temperature change over North America we could expect on a low carbon scenario, which we are nowhere close to following right now. That's the scenario on the left. The scenario on the right is what we're following. I haven't given you numbers, so here they are. That's an average temperature change across the lower continental United States of about 13 degrees Fahrenheit. The dark reds in the top North Pole are about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. On a low carbon scenario, if we are to sort of get religion right now, um, we can expect still quite a significant temperature change, yet another four degrees Fahrenheit uh, across the United States, uh, a little bit more than we've already had. Um, however, these scenarios are very, very different in, in their impacts, both to us and to natural systems. If we're on the scenario on the left, this is where we can expect things to be leveling off uh, in the latter half of this century. However, if we're on the scenario on the right, again, our current path, uh, this is not where the temperature rise ends. This is just where the simulation ends. And you can expect the rise and the temperature and the climate change to continue for another few centuries as well. Um, again, this is our current path, the high carbon scenario. <clears throat> Another projection helping us understand the risks a little bit better, particularly for us here in the West, is spring snowpack. So what I'm going to show you our snowpack in the spring, this is when it's at its maximum, ready to melt and give us our water. Most of us here in Utah get most of our water from melting snowpack. It's a giant reservoir in the mountains. The darker blues are the higher elevations and the deeper snowpack and the lighter Whites are the lower elevations and the thinner snowpack. And I'm going to show you data starting in 1950 and then projections under a high carbon scenario moving forward. So here's the data. And you can see that every year we always have significant snowpack. And certainly some years are snowier than others. We know that. But that snowpack is always there to give us our water. As we move forward, however, in projections under a high carbon scenario, as more of our precipitation comes as rain instead of snow, you see that snowpack dramatically thinned by the middle of the century, the next 30 years, and gone by the latter half of this century, say the next uh, 60 to 80 years or so. And of course, this has a dramatic impact on us here in Utah in terms of water availability. One more projection I want to show you is for soil moisture. This takes into account not only precipitation, but also temperature change. And so we're going to look at, does the soil get drier or wetter if the Places on the map get browner, they get drier, bluer is wetter. And you can actually find yourself in a kind of a perverse situation here where you can get moderately more precipitation. In fact, that is what is the most likely projection for us here in Utah and still end up drier. And that's because as the temperature goes up, evaporation intensifies quite dramatically. Those of us who try to keep anything alive in our lawns know this. This first projection is for a moderate carbon scenario, so we're not low emissions, but not high emissions either. We see significant drying through the middle of the century, continued drying through the end of the century, but it starts to level off as we start as our emissions tend towards zero. Um, <clears throat> and now let's look at that projection again under a high carbon scenario. Again, significant drying through the middle of the century, and then dramatically enhanced through the end of the century. And I'll say it again, under a high carbon scenario, this is not where it ends, it's just where we cut off the simulation. Now, I haven't given you an interpretation of these projections yet. Let me just tell you that the people who study this, everything from social systems to um, civil society, to food systems, energy systems, human health, you name it. The people who look at these projections refer to the scenario on the left as dangerous and the scenario on the right as catastrophic. And that was the same for the temperature projections when we looked at the low and the high as well. And that term catastrophic is used in the scientific community um, quite uh, uh, precisely, meaning unadaptable, unadaptable by our human systems and many natural systems. 
And it's good to look at this in this way, the temperature projections and the soil moisture projections, because this is our choice. We are currently choosing to move to the scenario in the situation on the right. We could choose the situation on the left. So you're starting to get a sense that the scale of risk that we're facing is ex indeed extraordinary. I have one last projection that I wanna show you to try to drive that home. And we're gonna do that by connecting the dots on this graphic. These dots are population centers on coastlines of a million people or more. By the end of the century, again, on our current trajectory, we can expect about two meters of sea level rise. Again, that's not where it ends but that's what we have by the end of the century. That will displace about 200 million people outright and flood another 600 million people annually. And so it's looking at projections like this that say, for example, the US Defense Department uh, looks at when they put out, and they've now put out more than a dozen reports in the last two decades referring to anthropogenic climate change as the single largest security threat to the United States and look at what we're facing. We're not talking about the displacement of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of people, but tens of millions to hundreds of millions of people. And the scale of societal disruption that that brings with it. So it's looking at projections like all of these that lead the scientific community, sort of represented by uh, Kevin Anderson here, former director of the Tyndall Climate Center in the United Kingdom, and one of the world's premier carbon cycle modelers to make statements like this. Uh, a very common statement, this is a mainstream assessment from the scientific community. And what Kevin means by this statement, by a 4C future, is four degrees Celsius of global average warming above pre-industrial, of which we've already seen 1.2 degrees. And he's saying it's incompatible with an organized global community based on the kinds of projections I just showed you and, and many, many more. And he goes further, likely to go beyond adaptation, devastating to a majority of ecosystems and a high probability of not being stable. So beyond adaptation, again, that notion of catastrophic. And I wanna talk just a little bit more about this notion of stability because herein lies the extreme end of our risk. So I think we're all familiar with the, the story of the Titanic. Most of us probably seen the movie. Um, it's kind of the perfect metaphor for all things catastrophic. And you may remember what happens, and they show it pretty well in the movie, is this kind of a glancing blow that the Titanic hits the iceberg and they skitter across the iceberg and it, it doesn't seem so bad, you know, some champagne glasses tip over in first class, but, uh, but it doesn't seem so bad. But the guy who built the boat is on the bridge and he's looking at the lights and he says to the captain, we've got to get everybody off the boat now. And the captain is confused because again, it didn't seem so bad. But the guy who built the boat says we're flooding five compartments and this ship can stay afloat with four compartments flooded, not five. And so when the ship started to flood that fifth compartment, that was a tipping point, a threshold in the system after which the system was gonna end up in a very different state. In other words, not floating on the surface of the Atlantic, but sitting on the bottom of the Atlantic. Now it didn't happen immediately, it took a couple of hours to play out. But once you cross thresholds in these complex systems, things play out very differently. And that's the notion that Kevin is talking about. So you remember this graph of carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And one of the thresholds that scientists have identified in the climate system is the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in particular, the last time in the planet's history, several million years ago, when we were above 350 parts per million for more than a century or so, this was an ice-free planet and Earth's sea levels were a couple of hundred feet higher. And so we have already crossed this particular threshold, this particular fifth compartment, we are already flooding. And so our task is to stop the flooding in that fifth compartment, to get ourselves back down below 350 parts per million as quickly as we can. And this is just one of a couple of dozen thresholds in the climate system that climate science believes are there. So the notion of stability is this, and we often model it with like a marble in a little dimple. And if you, you know, if you tap the, the marble a little bit, um, the conditions around it tend to take it back to where it was. So that's a stable, a stable system. And stable systems do that when they're disrupted a little bit. But if you disrupt them too much, that's when you cross the threshold, you start flooding the fifth compartment and the conditions around them no longer take them back to where they were, 
but accelerate them away from where they were. Think of the sinking ship and take you to a very, very different state. And the fact is we know that Earth's climate system behaves this way. In fact, it is the story of the previous uh, uh, few million years of glacial and interglacial cycles. So what I'm showing you here is a graph, and there's the Earth at the back there. About 12,000 years ago, when we were in this ice age and we popped up over the course of about 10 or 12,000 years into a much warmer, stable state, the Holocene. Now, as time has gone forward, um, we have arrived and kind of wandered ourselves out of this dimple because of the human's impact on the climate system. Uh, and we now find ourselves very close to thresholds. We don't know exactly where they are. There's uncertainty here, considerable uncertainty. But in this case, when the risks are this big, uncertainty is not our friend. Uncertainty of on this magnitude and with these kinds of risks at play is a reason for more caution, not less. And so we've gone from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. And our task moving forward is to, uh, is to move ourselves back into this stable Holocene-like climate to which human civilization is very finely adapted. Of course, the human species is, is extremely adaptable. We live in all kinds of climates and all kinds of extremes now, I don't think the uh, scientists at this point, the scientific community is talking about wiping out every last human, but not wiping out every last human should really not be our, our bar for success. The problem is, is even though that humans are very adaptable, human civilization is extremely finely tuned to the climate that we have. Think back again to those population centers on the coastlines. And so we need to stay in this Holocene-like state and not cross thresholds and change to a very, very different climate state, which is some called, times called hothouse earth. So hopefully looking at, oh, excuse me, I'm gonna take you through that again, apparently. Um, hopefully looking at this graph, when we see things like Hurricane Harvey or the, the intense fire seasons or the intense uh, storms, referred to in the press and by others as the new normal. Hopefully what this shows us is on our current trajectory, we are nowhere close to the new normal. The new normal isn't here yet. And we wanna make sure we don't find out what it would be like. We wanna get ourselves back into that Holocene state. So this is what uh, is driving statements like this from people like Kevin Anderson and hundreds, even thousands of other climate scientists. This is the mainstream view of the risk that we face. So now let's talk about what the science has to say about mitigating that risk. And the good news here is that the equation for doing so, at least at the highest level, is really quite simple. And the physics equation for mitigating this risk is this one, more carbon is more risk. And so if you can identify a danger line that you don't wanna cross, where are those thresholds? You can then calculate how much more carbon do we think we can throw up in the atmosphere and still stay below that danger line. That danger line has been calculated it is about one and a half degrees Celsius, again, of which we have already warmed about 1.2 degrees Celsius, so we're very close. And given that danger line, we can calculate a carbon budget for one and a half degrees, and here's that budget in billions of tons, gigatons of carbon dioxide as of last year. And here's how long it's gonna take us to burn through that budget. This is a very easy calculation to make on our current trajectory in our current consumption patterns, which have shown no signs of changing. Lots of talk about changing them, but they're not actually changing. So we're gonna burn through that in less than a decade. And so when you hear people say that we have say, for example, eight years or 10 years to address climate change, this is what they mean, but they're wrong. We don't have eight or 10 years to address climate change. We have no more time. In order to not go above that budget, our response has to be now, and it has to be big. Again, when the risks are this big, uh, uncertainty is not our friend and we need to be more cautious, not less. And here is that budget relative to our currently discovered reserves of coal and oil and natural gas, our carbon reserves that we are currently mining and extracting through tar sands and fracking and regular mining. So what the physics tells us is that we can really burn only about 5% of the carbon that we are already extracting. 
So no need for new exploration, no need to find more coal or oil or natural gas. We can only burn from any sense of risk management about 5% of the stuff that we've already found. And this is not conservative, this is not liberal, it's not progressive, it's not uh, politics, it's simply physics. This is just physics. <clears throat> so how do we do that? What would it look like for us to not burn through that budget? So what you're looking at here is a graph of our emissions, again, in billions of tons of carbon dioxide, going back to 1990, um, where we were about 20 billion tons, up to about last year where we were about 40 billion tons. And what has to happen, of course, is we have to peak, we have to do that now, and we have to decline and we need to be to zero emissions no later than the middle of the century. As long as our emissions are not zero, the warming continues. As long as our emissions are not zero, the warming continues. So this is what we would call a rational decarbonization of our civilization. We have got to decarbonize and we've got to do it very quickly. Now, here's where we're actually headed for the next 10 years in pink, for the next 10 years, which are the very most important that any of us will ever live through. We cannot win this battle in the next 10 years, but we can certainly lose it in the next 10 years. And in the next 10 years, the next five are the most important of that. Here's where we would be if the world held to its carbon uh, pledges from the Paris Climate Agreement. And here's where we need to go. So clearly Paris was, Paris was nowhere near what we needed. It was never intended to be, which is why uh, the nations are meeting yet again as we speak in Glasgow, trying to uh, uh, make better uh, uh, moves toward decarbonizing our civilization. But the task is enormous. Here's our budget for the math nerds. If you integrate under that curve, that's the total amount of carbon we can burn. If we wait just a little while to peak, not now, but a couple of years and peak a little bit later, that means we burn more carbon up front and we have to uh, make it up on the backside. And it, so this reduction gets steeper and it gets harder to do. So every year we delay makes things much, much harder. So what does it look like if we actually do this decline starting now and get to our goal and not burn through that budget? Roughly speaking, we need to cut our emissions in half every decade for the next several decades. Cut our emissions in half every decade. What that means is a 7% global decline in carbon emissions every single year. And this is where things get a little more complicated because not everybody's responsible for the same amount of emissions. About 10% of the planet is responsible for about half of our emissions. About 1% of the planet is responsible for 15% of our emissions. Um, if the top 10% of the world's emitters, which include a number of us on this phone call, were to cut their emissions to the average European, not an ascetic level, but an average European, that would reduce our emissions by a third. And so this is where the cuts have to come right now. The highest emitters, which is the, those of us with the highest quality of lifestyles have got to cut our emissions now in the next five years. The top 20% of the world's population is responsible for 80% of the world's emissions. This is the entire developed world. If the top 1% of the emitters in the United States, the top 1% of the emitters in the United States, just to let you know how hyper in unequal our emissions are, the top 1% of the, of the emitters in the US emit as much as 2,500 times as much as the bottom 1% in the world. These people, three and a half million, emit as much as 188 billion of these people would if there were in fact that many people. So this 7% global reduction really means about a 15% annual reduction for the developed world. And that includes all of us here uh, on this call today. We need to bend the emissions curve now have our emissions every decade. And that really means 15% per year for the developed world. And that's applicable on any scale from uh, the national to the regional, to the state, to the community, to the global. Now, I went through that very quickly and I wanna just have everyone take a breath and note that um, the task before us is extreme. It's not at all clear that we can do this. 
But I want to be very clear that it is not at all clear that we can't. As Sarah mentioned at the beginning of, uh, of our meeting today, we have the knowledge and the technology that we need to do make this transition. We have the knowledge and the technology. This is now primarily a cultural challenge. Nevertheless, it's an extraordinarily difficult cultural challenge. Uh, if COVID has taught us anything, it is that it is very difficult for us to get us to do things, even the simplest of things that even we ourselves assess as good for us. And so it's important to uh, conclude this talk by noting that climate change is one symptom of a much larger collection of global crises. And I wanna talk about this quote from Dwight Eisenhower who knew something about enormous challenges and overcoming them. If a problem is big, too big to be solved, I'm paraphrasing slightly, then make it bigger. And what he meant by this is if you're not seeing a way through uh, to the solution, then you're probably not considering all the pieces of the puzzle. And so I wanna briefly mention to you that climate change is one piece of global change among several. And the second piece that is enormous and largely at this point not due to climate change is our effect on the living systems on the planet. The ecologists tell us that human beings have wiped out nearly 70% of the world's living creatures in the last 40 years. 70% gone in the last 40 years. And that the extinction rate is now elevated by a factor of 100 to 1,000 times bigger than the background extinction rate. This is not from climate change, the ecologists tell us. Only about 15% of it is from climate change. This is from hyperpollution, hyperextraction, massive destruction of habitats. And of course, this is the biosphere that envelops us upon which human civilization is entirely dependent. It is arising from both climate change and our massive impact on the biosphere is arising from the human systems that we have developed to ostensibly make our lives good, our food system, our energy system, and most of all, our economic system. But those systems are wholly unsustainable. It is a system based on growth and hyper extraction and hyper consumption. We are currently consuming, over consuming our resource base by 170%, we need currently 1.7 planets worth of resources to provide us with the materials that we use and to absorb the wastes that we excrete, our human metabolism. Our plan on purpose is to double that consumption in the next two decades to three planets worth of resources and double again in the next two decades after that to six planets of resources. And the science of systems dynamics, complex systems dynamics, tells us that the chances that we get anywhere near this level of overconsumption is essentially zero. In other words, and this is again, not a, a, a result of climate change. This is arising from the same systems that are driving climate change. Fix climate change tomorrow, and this doesn't change. We cannot go on forgetting climate change on our current trajectory with the current systems that we have for another three decades. We simply can't do it. it. Nature will not allow it to happen. And so these systems need to transform. And the good news is transforming them is what we need to do to solve climate change and our massive impact on the biosphere as well. If everyone on the planet consumed like we in the United States consume, we wouldn't need just 1.7 planets to sustain us. We would need five planets to sustain us. And so again, the scale of inequity in who is causing the problem and who is not is, is extreme. And so it is those of us here in the United States and other developed places on the planet that have the biggest levers to pull in navigating these challenges. Remember this. Okay, so what I would like to do is give us a chance for um, some discussion uh, before, we, uh, before we end today. Let me just say that what I've told you sounds like tinfoil hat type stuff. It sounds utterly ridiculous. Civilization, the wheels are gonna start coming off in the next several decades uh, if we continue on this path. It just doesn't seem possible. It seems, uh, again, like this chicken little sky is falling. Oh, you environmentalists, you've been telling us that this has been coming for centuries, and it never does. 
you know, ever since Thomas Malthus. And then there was the population bomb in the 1970s. And, and, and we always find a way through. I want to leave you with this notion before we start our discussion. And that is, things have changed and they've changed dramatically. And that change came in the middle of the 20th century. That's when we went from being a small world on a big planet, meaning that the human collective metabolism of extraction and consumption and waste production from our human civilizational metabolism was generally small compared to the scale of the planetary systems that support us. That changed very rapidly as a result of exponential growth that is continuing, which emerges from our economic system that demands growth in order to thrive. That changed in the middle of the 20th century to becoming a big world on a small planet. The human collective civilizational metabolism is now uh, on a scale of the, the planetary systems that support us. We are massively disrupting those systems. And I want you to just think back to March of last year. If you think that massive change can't come in a heartbeat as a result of exponential growth, that's precisely what happened with COVID. A virus spreads with exponential growth. We saw it happen. Uh, we went from no cases to thousands and thousands of cases here in Utah overnight. And that is what is driving these uh, risks that we are facing. So when you think about, oh, this can't possibly happen, it just doesn't sound reasonable. Um, things have fundamentally changed. And the problem with exponential growth is by the time you recognize that you've got a problem, it's very close to too late to stop it. We've recognized it. It's very close to too late, but we're not there. And so thinking about whether we can stop it or not stop it is not productive. What we have to think about are what are the next steps and we take them. What are the next steps and we take them? We, we identify a next step and we take it and we identify a next step and, I take, and we take it. It is not for us to say that this is not possible. It is for us, particularly those of us in the developed world, to do as absolutely as much as we can to make sure that we do not flood that fifth compartment and end up on the bottom of the ocean. So thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, and I want to uh, maybe end there and remind you that there is a much larger discussion uh, next week uh, in which the solutions to this uh, will be discussed, uh, solution pathways, I should say, will be discussed in much more detail. But for that, let's let's stop and let me um, stop sharing my screen here and let's take some questions. Thanks, Rob. Okay, the first question we have up is, given the lessons of COVID, namely the resistance to things like masks and vaccines, do you realis realistically believe that the massive reductions in energy consumption have any chance at all? If not, what should individuals do to protect themselves from a greenhouse earth future? Wow, wonderful question. And of course, it's, it's what we all ask ourselves. But I'm going to revert back to something I just said. We do not definitively know that we cannot do this. And simply flipping into a state of despair and throwing up our hands is just not an option. When you're in an emergency, a hope-despair framework is not useful. The framework that's useful is resolve. When you're in a burning house, you don't hope that you get out. You don't despair that you can't. You just get out by any means necessary. And you do that by taking the next step. What's the next step to get out? Okay, what's the next step to get out? And we continue to do that until we're out or until we're dead. An emergency mindset is what we have to have. So uh, do I realistically believe that we can do this? I, I don't ask myself that anymore. Um, it's just not a useful question because it is not answerable. What is useful is what's the next step. Now, given what you said, clearly, and our experience with COVID shows us this, shows us this, this is a cultural challenge and we have not figured out how to unlock that lock, but I'll make one more statement on that. And that's this. In the world of systems dynamics science, one of the most important pieces of complex systems are information flows, the feedbacks that allow the system to correct itself. Think of a furnace or an environmental system in your house. Um, there needs to be a feedback between uh, that the system uses. So what's the temperature in the house? What do I need to do? Turn on the furnace, turn on the air conditioner. And if that feedback, if that 
information flow is accurate and timely and quick, then you get a really good response in the system. If that, if that information flow is broken, if the furnace and the air conditioner don't know if it's too hot or too cold and what they're supposed to do, then you're gonna get a chaotic environment. You're never gonna get the temperature you want, the environment you want. And clearly in our society right now, um, our societal system, the information flows are broken, utterly broken. We can't all get on the same page with what the problem is. And that's why we can't all get on the same page with the solution pathways. And we all know what I'm talking about. I don't think we need to go any further in that. But if one of the things that you think you can do is work on fixing these systems of information flows, it's critically important that we do that. That's one of the keys to unlocking the cultural challenge. As far as what you can do to prepare yourself for a global warming world, you can, you can try to create a bunker if you want. There's billionaires out there doing that, but they're not going to do it. It's not going to do it for them. The strength that we have is in community. If, you want to, if, if we want to navigate this, we've got to have strong, resilient communities. That means people talking to each other, people on the same page with the same basic information. If you want to better your chances for navigating this and for your children, then work on building strong communities. That's my personal opinion. And I think backed up by a lot of data. So what are um, small scale mitigation solutions that each of us can participate in, but then how do we take those and globalize them? Right, so Sarah mentioned something at the very top that is critically important. We're not talking about this enough in the language that we need to be talking about it. So the very first thing you can do is start talking about this. Have these conversations with your families, with your peers, with your friends, with your colleagues. Um, in your own lives, we now need to reduce our carbon emissions. This is a systemic problem, but we have waited so long that we've got to give a little elbow room to the systems to transform, and that's going to take a little time. So I would say the very first thing you can do on a personal level, this year, commit to reducing your own carbon emissions by 15%. The biggest emissions for, for, for us personally are how we eat. Industrial animal agriculture is responsible for approximately 20% of the world's emissions. Industrial animal agriculture is responsible for 20% of our emissions. Moving to a heavily plant-based diet dramatically reduces our own personal emissions. And man, you can do it and be healthy and be eating lots of tasty food, especially here in Utah. There's lots of ways to do that. So can you reduce your consumption of industrial animal products 15% this year? Can you drive 15% less? Can you fly 15% less? Those are the biggies. And can you change, can you reduce your, your personal home environmental emissions, how you heat and cool and power yourself at home by 15%? Pretty easy for a year. Gets a little harder the second year, gets a little harder the second year, especially if the systems are fighting us. So what's absolutely critical is that those of us who have the capacity, the personal capacity, the energy, the financial capacity, the time capacity to work on systemic changes have to do it. We've got to stretch our comfort zones. I know it's easier to change your light bulbs and reduce your meat consumption than to, to, to engage in the public square. But there's, there's no doubt for it. That's what we need now. And I'll say one more thing on that. How we do that has to happen in myriad ways. You can do it from within the system, from when you're within your own professions, transforming things from within the system. But I'm aware of no example of massive cultural transformation that of this scale that has come without massive cultural agitation. Direct action activism plays an enormous role in cultural change of this scale and we need it and it needs to be strategic and it needs to be organized and there are groups out there doing it. So if you feel like you can be on the pointy end of the sphere, spear, do that. If you feel like you can change things from within your profession as an architect or a financier or a banker or a lawyer, do that. But it's critically that we be engaged in addressing this problem, not only from within our personal lives, but from within our professional lives, if we at all have the capacity to do so. Okay. So um, how do you prevent yourself from accepting climate doomerism? Have you ever experienced climate grief and how do you deal with that? And consequently, then how would the rest of us deal with it? 
Such a great question. And as you might imagine, in people doing my, my line of work, it's a big topic of discussion. Uh, Self-care, mental health. And I'll tell you that people take personal days. People uh, sometimes just take a day off. You know, you wake up and you read the headline or you listen to the news report and it's you just say to yourself, what fresh hell is this? Um, <clears throat> what I have found... The mindset that works for me is, again, the mindset of an emergency in the background, so to speak, which says that hope and despair are simply not useful. Resolve, what is the next step? I don't focus on identifying every step to the top of the, top of the mountain. I focus on the next steps that I can take, both personally and most of all professionally, to move us forward, and then I take those steps. And I'll quote, you know, one of our greatest spokespersons that's that's arisen in the last few years, Greta Thunberg, and the whole, her and thousands of other youth in the whole global youth movement. But I think they've articulated this uh, perfectly. If you want, well, I'll, I'm paraphrasing, but here it is. Hope isn't free. Hope isn't free. It's not there for us to consume. It's for us to generate. And the price of generation is action. If you want hope, act, not the other way around. If you want hope, act. And if you're just in a hopeless place, take some time, make sure the self-care is happening. Eat well, get plenty of rest as much as you can. Um, I meditate, I, just about everybody I know meditates to get ourselves in that frame of mind of I'm not concentrating on the whole journey. It's a mindset of cathedral builders. The people who built the cathedrals in, in the Gothic cathedrals, they knew they were never going to see them completed. The Gothic cathedral in Chartres, France, took 300 years to build. The people who laid the foundation did their job. It's the power of community having faith that the people coming along next would do their jobs. Now, we're not doing it time sequentially here. We're doing it all at once. I'm doing my job in terms of the communication and other things. And I am having faith that other people are doing their jobs in fixing our voting system, fixing our political system, fixing our information flows, fixing our food system, fixing our energy and economic systems. There are all people working on that. So many people working on that. Utah Clean Energy is a perfect example just having huge impact. And I don't do that work because I don't need to, because they're doing that work. This is the power of community. So my mindset is to be a cathedral builder. I'm gonna do my part. I'm gonna identify the next step and not worry about whether this is possible again, because the question is unanswerable. And, and the, the, the joy that comes from that is often overwhelming. The opportunities that we have to fix just everything, are enormous. They're just enormous. We have the knowledge and the technology we need scientifically. What we need is the knowledge and social technology. And there's so many people working on that as well. So um, if you're a storyteller, if you can figure out how to tell this story and get more people on board and understood and jazzed about moving to a world that is not on the brink of collapse, but navigating to a place that is sustainable and just and vibrant, man, what a challenge, man, what an opportunity we have. And so I try to focus on that. And, and when the news is just overwhelmingly bad, I, I step back a little bit, apply my sort of tech, my, my own personal strategies and then focus on what's next. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davies, so much. There are still a really fabulous questions in the queue that we don't have time to get to. We, what we will do is we'll get those questions to the panel for next week and see if we can't get those answered as part, as the, uh, part of the discussion next week. Because there are some tremendous questions on here that, that I would like to see answered. And Dr. Davies, thank you so much for taking this time to educate us and to inform us and to spend this time with us. I know it's a huge amount of preparation and we're very grateful. Thank you so much for the invitation. And let me just say, everybody, I'm Robert Davies at Utah State University. Look me up. Feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to engage further. Thank you so much.
And thanks to everyone that attended. I hope that we see you next week and we'll save these questions and see if we can't get to them next week.